I'm Todd, a pretty beautiful and intelligent man. At the very least, I believe so, and I have a high level of self-esteem. I work as a programmer for a commercial organization, and the best thing is that I just need to spend 50 minutes per week to earn a fair living. However, this does not imply that I am lazy the rest of the time. I'm constantly learning and growing myself. I've studied numerous motivating books, watched interviews with successful individuals, and gotten myself out of poverty. So I treasure all I own and am grateful for it every day. But maybe the nicest thing in my life is my wife, Judith, who is four years my junior. She's 25 and I'm 29. She is a model who appears in a variety of advertising campaigns and has a large social media following, and she thoroughly enjoys her life. Judith has fit, tanned, body-toned thighs and an excellent bust. But she wasn't always like this. Her life altered dramatically after meeting me. When we met, she was simply a cashier with no ambitions or goals. But I noticed something remarkable about her and helped her understand it. Even back then, I had a fantastic job. And while I didn't make as much as I do today, I could buy a lot. I persuaded Judith to leave her cashier job and got her a fantastic producer who helped her flourish on social media. We now live in luxury thanks to our combined wages. It may sound like a success tale, but reality slammed me hard. Philip and Alan, two of my school friends, stayed with me for a time. When we became 18, we tried to establish our own business with an ice cream shop, but it failed very quickly. We tried again six months later, this time with a hot dog stand. But that did not endure long, either. We made a couple more tries after that, but they were all unsuccessful. When I turned 21, I understood I needed to make a change, so I entered the field. Even though it was new to me, I felt it had potential. My buddies thought it was a bad idea. They remarked, You are wasting your time. You should concentrate on the important stuff. Create your own thing rather than working for someone else, but I disagreed. I recognized the long-term benefits of being adept at it, and it paid off. Philip and Alan continued to try to build enterprises. They now have one fast food stand that has been doing well for three years, but the profits are minimal, so they share them. They are locked in their ways. While I've been able to travel with good things and have a model wife, they nevertheless live in a busy city, dealing with the stresses of daily life. I carry no malice toward them for declining to hang out with me. It was their decision, and I respect it. Our relationship is no longer as strong as it once was, but we continue to communicate. They stop around on weekends, relax on my nice leather couch, and we play video games and talk about the typical stuff. Despite our differences, we've managed to maintain our friendship by usually catching up at my place. They appreciated my posh digs, but I had no idea my wife was also appealing to them. Meeting up with Philip and Alan was a welcome change for me. They were regular guys with no fancy degrees, which I enjoyed. I could just hang out with them, have a drink, and shoot the breeze without any pretense. I didn't feel the need to display anything in front of them. Instead, I attempt to be relatable and honest. Judith did not mind that I spent a couple nights a week with the guys. She had her own group of pals and frequently hung out with them. Judith and I were strong on hospitality, so our house was often bustling with visitors. One evening, while I was driving home, my neighbor Jimmy, a director, hailed me down. He wanted to talk, assuring me he wasn't prying, but he'd seen something odd. A Ford was frequently parked outside my house when I wasn't there. He even took a picture. I looked at his phone and noticed a white Ford. My friend Phillips ride. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. I'll check it out. I said... Jimmy then requested me to keep a watch on his house while I was there and let him know if I saw the car. Sure thing. Good night, I said. Thanks so much. Good night. This was a serious worry. Why was my pal visiting my wife during working hours? With that question gnawing at me, I entered the house where Judith, dressed in a white robe, greeted me. Without saying anything, she ushered me in, unveiling a surprise. Darling, welcome home. Pull this string she instructed. I complied. Judith had purchased a seductive nurse's outfit which revealed a breathtaking sight. You appear fatigued, but I have precisely the solution. First, take a shower, then meet me in my clinic, Judith instructed. I quickly showered and Judith and I had an incredible night. The spontaneity washed away all of my worries and I completely succumbed to the present moment. The next day there was nowhere to rush to. 
Judith and I were planning to spend the entire day together. I tried to tell myself that Philip must have stopped by yesterday to collect something he had forgotten and then departed in a rush. I didn't want to consider the possibility of Judith cheating on me, especially with my pal. We enjoyed a usual day together and planned to relax with a movie in the evening, but Alan interrupted our plans by suggesting we hit a club. Come on, it's going to be a blast. Bring Judith, he encouraged. I declined not only because we had other arrangements, but also because I didn't want to go clubbing with Judith while Philip and Alan didn't have companions. Philip attempted to settle down, even marrying his wife, but ended up cheating on her, resulting in a breakup. Alan, on the other hand, had a run of short-lived partnerships, the longest of which lasted only one year. I would always advise them to find girlfriends if they wanted to go out together. They just nod and promise me that they will find someone shortly. I discussed Alan's invitation with Judith and could sense her dismay. She seemed to want to go out and have some fun, but I dismissed it. I left after kissing Judith goodbye and went to work the next day. Jimmy, my neighbor, contacted Todd around midday. Our automobile has once again been parked near your home. Not sure when it arrived. Just giving you a heads up. Thank you, Jimmy. Will you be home all day? Yep, I'll be around. Could you call me when the car leaves? Is it not too much trouble? Of course, I'll keep you posted. We said goodbye and worries entered my head once more. Five hours later, the phone rang. Todd, the car is pulling away. Two guys entered. I thanked Jimmy before hanging up. Now there were no more doubts. My two friends paid a visit to my wife while I was away. I initially assumed it was only Philip, but now I see Alan is also involved. Initially, I attempted to console myself, thinking they were arranging a surprise for my birthday. However, my birthday was still four months away. Was it too soon for a surprise to put my mind at ease? I asked an acquaintance for a favor. A few video cameras and a listening gadget. I collected the gear after work. When questioned, make up a justification. As I drove home, my hands trembled. I felt guilty for eavesdropping on my wife. I was completely confident she would never betray me. When I arrived home, Judith welcomed me kindly. We ate a delicious lunch and went to bed for another personal session. Throughout, I noticed nothing amiss. A woman's manner usually alters when she cheats, but Judith seemed to be her regular self, if not better. The following morning, Judith prepared for a video shoot, and I followed along in the rear seat of my car. Set the forgotten cameras during the voyage. Judith asked about them. What's inside the bag, hon? I only needed to get rid of some work-related items. I said, I'll take care of it later, hitting two birds with one stone, while Judy was at work. I went home. Time slipped away. Before I knew it, two hours had passed. Nonetheless, all of the cameras were set up. One is in the bedroom, the other in the living room, a third in the kitchen, and a fourth outside. It slipped my mind that I was supposed to pick up Judith when she stepped outside. I saw a white Ford come in with Judith and Philip getting out. I phoned you twenty times. Todd, where did you disappear? Judith exclaimed, and checking my phone. Indeed, she missed twenty calls. I apologized, but Judith simply walked by me without speaking. Then Philip approached. You really messed up, man. I had to manage everything myself. Sorry. I got held up. I had to fix something urgently. Don't worry, I have your back, given how many times you've assisted me. After saying goodbye, I returned indoors. The evening ended in a tense stillness. Judith was still furious with me for not picking her up, so I attempted to apologize. You said you would pick me up. Why didn't you attend? There was an unexpected hurry job. Please forgive me. I will not let this happen again. We hugged and went to bed. I felt ashamed for doubting her. I couldn't get the suspicion that Jimmy, the elderly neighbor, was having hallucinations. But given the photographs he gave, I needed to confirm everything firsthand. While Judith slept soundly at night, I decided to unlock her phone and go through her texts. To my relief, I discovered nothing strange. Her phone was clean, with a clear conscience. I nodded off to sleep. Two weeks have passed since I set cameras throughout the house while working. I kept a close eye on Judith's actions at home. Everything appeared regular, with no indication of misconduct. Despite the initial clear bill on her phone, I was impelled to examine Judith's texts again. Every time, the result was the same. There are no symptoms of adultery or questionable interactions with my friends. Life proceeded along its calm path. Philip and Alan joined us for a quality hangout. We visited the city's charms, while Judith balanced work and our adventures. 
During one shift at work, I decided to look at the cameras again, albeit with a sense of fatigue. I couldn't shake the sense of futility. My suspicions were always unfounded, but suddenly a new concern arose. What if Judith discovers the cameras and believes I don't trust her? As I thought, I looked at the monitor and noticed Judith opening the door. It took me off guard. Switching to the outdoor camera, I noticed a white Ford parked nearby. Philip and Alan stood on the porch, greeted warmly by Judith, before going inside. I unplugged the listening device placed beneath the living room coffee table. Judith proceeded upstairs to her bedroom while Philip and Alan relaxed on the couch. Their bare torsos are exposed. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, I watched Judith pull out a sexy outfit from the wardrobe, the same one she'd worn for me the night before. My gaze stayed fixed on the scene unfolding before me. And in that instant, I decided what to do with them. It was time to get rid of the rubbish, quite literally. I contacted someone using an untraceable number. Let us refer to him as Mr. Keller, who is well known for managing such situations quietly, trembling. I explained the entire thing to Mr. Keller over the phone. My grasp is slipping on the device. I get it. We will be ready, at the drop-off point. Once the payments are done, the automobile will drive to your location to collect the rubbish. The chat was brief, but the fee of such a service was not inexpensive. I needed to act quickly to get to the payment location. Fortunately, I had enough cash in my car for the work. As I examined the cams, I noticed my wife already engaging in personal actions with my buddies. The nausea struck me hard. If I hadn't known, I would have came home later and kissed her. I drove wildly, caught up in a maelstrom of emotions. My entire body shook and I thought I may pass out. The pain was unbearable and a tear escaped my eye. How could my childhood friends and my wife betray me in this way? It was beyond comprehension. I quickly arrived at the given location, an old abandoned structure. I needed to leave an envelope, so I hid it under a stone and sent a coded message. Eggs were laid, nearly instantly. I received a reply. My chicks have flown out of the nest. Hurrying back home, I parked close and watched from a distance. Jimmy called to let me know about the white Ford near my house. But I told him that everything was great. I turned on the cams and saw two men feasting with my wife on our leather sofa. It felt like viewing an adult film, stinging but soothing in the hope of imminent justice. Within ten minutes of my return, a white van arrived. Three big males dressed in black and masked burst into my home with precision. One knocked Philip out, another restrained Alan, and a third hushed Judith. They were handcuffed, blindfolded, and quickly taken away in the vehicle, which drove away. I was in awe of their efficiency. The entire surgery lasted approximately 40 seconds. All I could do was wait for the results in a few days. I checked with my neighbor, who thankfully found nothing, returning to work during my evening trip home. I contacted the police and reported my wife missing. Prior to that, I disposed of and destroyed Judith's and my friend's phones, making them untraceable. The next day, a tow crew removed the white Ford parked at my house. I contacted the police. Sticking with my scenario, I arrived home to discover my wife vanished and no clues in sight. Surprisingly, every neighbor reported seeing the white Ford near my house when I wasn't there. It wasn't only Jimmy who noticed it. Because the car was registered in Philip's name, he became the primary suspect. Initially, I was treated with distrust. However, when they verified with my job, they discovered that I had not left on the day of the disappearance. Meanwhile, as the inquiry progressed, I dutifully saved up all camera recordings to a disc and stored them safely. Four days later, an unidentified video surfaced showing three bodies being dropped off at a remote site. The video shows them being taken from a van, shackled and helpless in an empty field. They wailed and begged for compassion, which I found strangely pleasurable to witness. Because my sole condition was that no harm should come to anyone, they were abandoned in the desert with their hands unbound. I was told to remain still for an hour. Following that, the van left, leaving their fate totally in their own hands. They were carried by van from Nevada to Texas. And by that point, I didn't care if they returned alive or not. A month later, the case came to a halt with the investigator speculating that my wife had fled with Philip and was having an affair. I bought into his theory. Alan wasn't on anyone's radar because he didn't have a family or a girlfriend, and their business venture had failed due to a lack of attention for a month. 
I didn't get a divorce to avoid arousing suspicion. Instead, I hired a lawyer to initiate the procedure. If Judith did not return home within a few months, we may sue for divorce, citing her disappearance one month later. I was summoned to the police station to provide identification. They provided me with a photograph of two guys and a woman. Initially, I did not identify my wife or two friends. They appeared to have aged two decades overnight, which I found humorous. They appeared in shabby, ripped clothes, malnourished, and in a sorry shape. I recognized all three and asked about their whereabouts. The detective informed me that in Texas, two naked crazy robbed a gas station, stole a car, and fled in an unknown direction. Within 24 hours, the automobile was discovered abandoned on the roadside. They had picked a car without fuel, which limited their escape. They were captured and are currently serving time in prison. I exhaled, thinking, well, at least they are alive. This wasn't what I expected. I expected them to be sensible enough to return home safely. Instead, out of despair, they turned to crime. It frightened me to discover these were folks I had spent a large portion of my life with. However, I felt no sympathy for them. Who could possibly feel sorry for them? I managed to get a divorce. It was not an easy task, but I succeeded, officially getting my freedom. I traveled to Texas once to address each of those who had betrayed me face to face. They all appeared absolutely out of it. But what surprised me was that none of them suspected my involvement. None of them considered that it could be retribution for their betrayal. It upset me that they did not realize the gravity of their transgression against me. I was glad to remain in the shadows, but when I looked at them, they seemed strange to me. Lost souls. When I questioned Judith if she had deceived me, she just murmured, Never. I smiled and walked away. I had expected a fight. I expected them to return home and realize I was the one who sent them to the desert. However, they proved to be so weak and ignorant that they dug themselves an even deeper ditch. I simply provided them the opportunity to expose their true colors under pressure. However, they chose cowardice and criminality instead. I'm not sure how I would have acted in their shoes, but I will say this much. I would not have ended up in such a situation. I cherish those around me and always maintain honesty. But if somebody wrongs me, I will not hesitate to take action. I recently migrated to Florida, with plans to stay for at least a year. It doesn't really matter whether I find a girlfriend or not. I've become more calm about life. Financially, I'm prepared for a comfortable future without denying myself anything. I take pride in being knowledgeable and careful, constantly working to improve, and hoping that my experience will inspire others to make the right decisions, regardless of their circumstances. Remember how life throws you garbage? Grab a rake and start cleaning up. Garbage belongs in the trash can, not in your lifetime. Thank you for hearing my story. That is the end of it. All right, that was a funny story. Now let us go on to another intriguing one. Stay tuned and let's dive in. I'm Ryan, a man recognized for his caring attitude and gentle manner, always willing to give my wife whatever she wants. It took me two marriages to realize this lesson. Being excessively accommodating and satisfying all of your loved one's wishes might engender hatred and disrespect. That is a mistake I will not repeat. These pampered ladies believe they can fool their partners as long as they do not get caught believing everything is good. They cover their guilt in a variety of ways until it is exposed, at which point they suddenly show regret, stating they never wanted to hurt their spouse. Do they hear themselves? What do we make of their claims? Do they recognize they are confessing to deception and only regret being caught? It's a clear insult. I am persuaded that these women lack basic knowledge. Sandy and I met after exiting unhealthy relationships. She had been with Billy for three years when he left her for someone younger and more appealing. Sandy was left feeling bitter and low in self-esteem after being abandoned by the man she loved. Her unresolved feelings for Billy have always worried me to some extent. My name is Ryan, and I am six years older than Sandy. I was previously married to a beautiful woman named Charlotte, whom I adored. However, she deceived me by having many relationships behind my back at a time when I was madly in love with her. It took me a year to discover her cheating, which left me extremely devastated. After leaving her, I promised never to tolerate such betrayal again. This incident taught me that trust would be a struggle in any new relationship. 
Sandy and I were aware of each other's baggage from the beginning. I helped Sandy enhance her self-esteem by encouraging her to go to the gym and shape her body into a lovely figure. She spent her leisure time shopping for new outfits, indulging herself at the salon and playing tennis with my full support. Knowing my prior problems, she transformed into a confident, radiant lady in return. Sandy worked hard to help me overcome my trust concerns. She repeatedly informed me that I was her one and only love, expressing appreciation for having me in her life. Every day she showers me with love declarations and ensures that all of my desires are satisfied. Our intimacy remains strong, with passionate encounters taking place at least four times per week. We continued to have romantic moments on the couch and discussed starting a family. We felt like soulmates and everything seemed great, or so I thought. However, a week after our sixth anniversary, my world was upended. Sandy was wearing a gorgeous dress I had never seen before, an unexpected pick for a relaxed weekday morning. Although I don't usually spy on my wife. We have home video surveillance, which I periodically check while bored at work. I usually love watching our dog, Brandy, who brings me solace after a difficult day at work. But that morning, seeing Sandy dressed to the nines piqued my interest. She looked stunning in a short red dress and sky-high heels. Her hair and cosmetics were perfectly done. It was a sight that both enthralled and troubled me, giving me a nervous feeling. I instantly dialed my wife's number, eager to find out what she was up to. Hello, honey. I was just thinking of you. How is your day going? Tennis plans. Hello, love. I miss you, too. There is no tennis today. Kara hurt her ankle, so I decided to take today off. That is a shame. I understand how much you enjoy playing. Any other plans? Not really. I haven't worked it out yet. Perhaps visit the gym. Do you want to get some lunch? I can stop by and pick you up. That's nice, but not today. I feel bloated and am not hungry. I'm just going to grab a protein drink at the gym. See you tonight. I love you, babe. I didn't end the call as usual. I love you. She undoubtedly noticed because I always say this before hanging up. She tricked me, and I am determined to discover the truth behind her falsehoods. Despite years of trust in Sandy, I still had a GPS tracker in her car, a relic from the past intended for protection but now used to spy on my wife. After hanging up the phone, I left my office and activated the tracker in my car. Sandy was heading downtown, so I followed suit. My office was close to the city center and I caught up with her as she entered a parking garage outside. I waited anxiously for her to appear. Five minutes later, there she was, my lovely wife in heels and a short dress on her way to Fellini, an upmarket restaurant. My stomach twisted with anxiety, hoping that I would not be betrayed again. As I watched her gesture to a man outside the restaurant, my worries were realized. I moved closer and saw them kiss. Their personal talk indicated problems, sneaking across the street. I peered through the glass and saw their passionate embrace as they waited to be seated. Sandy leaned softly into his shoulder, making me feel completely betrayed. Sorrow welled up in my eyes, but rage quickly overtook me, wiping away my sorrow. I grabbed my phone and took photos through the glass as I lowered it. I saw him turn to Sandy and give her a deep kiss. My heart shattered as I captured her response to his kiss, placing her arms around his neck and bringing him closer. In that moment, I activated the video camera, capturing their intimate hug. A combination of sadness and wrath overtook me, propelling me down a dark path. Before I could decide, the hostess led them to their table. When I recognized the man who had ruined Billy Sandy's life, my blood boiled. Now she was back in his arms. Sandy understood my feelings for him, and I had made it obvious that she should never speak to him again. Clearly, she ignored my wishes. Anger overtook me as I realized she had lied to me, dressed up to meet him, exchanged a passionate kiss, and spent the entire day with him all in the last hour. This degree of disrespect and humiliation was overwhelming. I couldn't take it any longer. The pledge I made to myself after my previous marriage prevented me from putting up with such disrespect. It was over, and all that remained were more lies and excuses from my soon-to-be ex-wife fueled by fury. I returned to the workplace and spent the remainder of the day at my desk, trying to figure out how this might happen again. I'll be feeling sorry for myself for the next five hours. I'd already returned home, preparing my next step. I wondered if Sandy would tell the truth about her day or continue to deceive me, making my next step simpler. 
Despite my rage, I was able to contain it and drive home to confront the end of my marriage. Tears welled up in my eyes as I drove into the driveway, mourning the loss of the woman I had once loved and respected. Sandy was preparing a delicious dinner on the table, dressed in a nice attire and showing me affection. As I entered the kitchen, she kissed me passionately and told me how much she missed me. It felt like classic cheating wife behavior, an attempt to relieve her guilt and pay for the previous six months of neglect. No matter how hard I tried to look regular, when she glanced at me and said, Honey, are you okay? I knew my attempts had failed. Has something occurred? I poured myself a long glass of Mr. Daniels, tried to grin and relax, and said, It's fine. It's been a busy day. Let me get dressed and ready for supper, and I'll be down shortly. In the bedroom, I changed my clothing, sat on the bed, and drank my beverage, feeling the elixir soothe my body. Heading downstairs, I entered the kitchen to find my lovely wife cheerfully preparing the table for dinner. She appeared content, evidently pleased with the day she had with her lover. As we sat together, I started a chat. Sandy, this supper is excellent. You look amazing today. Thank you. I love you, honey, and I enjoy cooking for you, she remarked with a contented smile. We sat in awkward quiet while eating, and I noticed Sandy looking at me. Perhaps they sensed something was awry, but she felt guilty which she admitted today. I waited for responses in the next five minutes. So, tell me about your day, including what you did for lunch, I asked in a non-threatening tone. So, following your call, I went to the gym for a few hours, grabbed a protein bar, and then came home to prepare dinner for you. She said, It's been pretty dull. When she saw my sorrowful expression, she diverted her gaze and focused on her dish. I continued in subdued tones. So, Sandy, how will we handle this? Are we going directly to the lawyers, or would you like to see a therapist first? What do you mean, honey, about the divorce? Of course, I clarified. Do not be silly. What? Divorce, she replied. I mean the end of our marriage, separation, figuring out how to go forward while remaining friendly, I explained. I do not comprehend. Why do you desire a divorce? Seriously? She inquired, puzzled. I will give you some time to think about that question before I respond. She appeared to be flustered. Her hands fidgeted with her glasses and she avoided making eye contact with me. Several minutes passed in silence. No, I lied. Feeling a sense of remorse, yet it didn't matter. For some reason, I didn't want her to learn the truth. Why are you wondering if I've been keeping track of you? Is there anything I should be aware of? She inquired. She appeared bewildered, at a loss for words. It is typical of deceivers to deny their acts. As expected, she asserted that nothing wrong was going on. And the professor? Confusion. Why are you bringing up the divorce? She asked with a sorrowful heart. I looked into her eyes, expecting that she would open up and confess. After a long silence, I sighed. Let me show you what's bothering me, Sandy. I unlocked my phone and displayed a snapshot of her and Billy having a kiss outside the restaurant. Though it may be mistaken as a nice gesture, I postponed any further photographs until I heard her explanation for her duplicity. Her jaw fell, tears welling in her eyes. Predictably, she scrambled for reasons. Honey, let me explain. It was merely a pleasant welcome, nothing more. Where did you even find this photo? So, how's Billy doing these days, sweetheart? I'll describe how I acquired this photo. I was leaving the software store crossing the street when I thought I spotted you coming into the restaurant hand in hand with someone. I raced across the street and glanced through the window. There you were, and he had his arm around you. At first, I doubted it was you, but I was mistaken. It was indeed. You. Then I wondered why you were dressed so attractively in that short dress in high heels. You never dress like that for me anymore. That's when I saw you with Billy. And everything clicked. I snapped some photos right when you leaned in to kiss him. That's how I got this picture. In the next photo. You had your arms wrapped around his neck, and your short dress was hiked up, leaving your behind exposed. You looked stunning in that dress with your hair and makeup done so perfectly. Were you off to a modeling gig or auditioning for a role as a racetrack girl? Tell me, why dress like that for him? I can't recall the last time you dressed so attractively for me. She buried her face in her hands, Tears streaming down her cheeks while I waited for her response, staring at her intently. When she remained silent, I pressed on.
You know, my new 22 phone has an incredible camera. It can zoom in with such clarity. Let me show you, I said, moving closer to her arm wrapped around Billy's neck. I zoomed in on her ring finger, now bare of any wedding bands, and held the image up to her. No wedding rings today. That's strange. I can't recall you ever taking them off in all the time we've been together. Today must have been quite special. Do you understand now why I'm talking about divorce? You lied to me this morning about your day. You removed your wedding rings, dolled up like a woman of ill repute to meet your old flame, and then lied to me again just a few minutes ago. You're sitting here in front of me telling me lies, I exclaimed, frustration oozing through my voice. You claim you spent the day at the gym and did not eat anything for lunch, yet you dressed up in your finest gear to meet your ex-lover and spend the day with him while I work hard to improve our lives. You breached your commitment to never see him again. You openly kissed and flirted with another man. You treated me like a fool lying through your teeth. I don't care whether you slept with him or not today. It is irrelevant. What matters is that you have proven that you cannot maintain your promises, and you will lie to me without hesitation. You made every attempt to impress your ex, abandoned your marriage by removing your rings, and constantly lied to me. To me, that is grounds for divorce. You are fully aware of this. Sandy was rattled to the core. Ryan's comments pierced through her, making her realize the significance of her actions. Until now, she dismissed it as harmless teasing and flirtation. But Ryan's frank appraisal caused her to perceive herself as a betrayed wife. For the first time, she realized that her relationship with Billy had become an emotional affair touching on infidelity. Not physically, but emotionally. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she dealt with the weight of her treachery. She couldn't shake the sorrow that was nibbling at her heart as she realized she had caused her spouse so much agony. In that moment, she determined to herself to contact Ryan and save their marriage. Ryan, please trust me. I swear that nothing happened, she pleaded. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she sought a way out of the situation. I know how it looks today, and if the situations were reversed, I would still feel deceived. I'm so sorry. Can you find it in your heart to pardon my foolishness? It is beyond foolish. Especially after what you experienced with your ex-lover, the one person I had promised to avoid. Can you explain why I dressed up like that for him, except my wedding rings? Could you please explain why we held hands and kissed? Can you explain why I continued to lie to you? Tell me, dear, does any of this mean anything to you? Because if it were the other way around, I'm sure you'd react differently, Ryan. I understand that it looks bad. However, I removed my rings while painting my nails. I neglected to put them back on when I discovered I was late. It's a weak justification that I can't justify, but I swear I didn't try to conceal them. He knows we are married. He knows you are married, but he still wants to see you and openly kiss you, and you went along with everything. That isn't a plausible excuse. She let a trace of annoyance seep into her voice. I am at a loss for words, Ryan. I was having lunch with a buddy and just wanted to appear beautiful. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. You lied and met him. Do you think I'm foolish? This meeting needed to be planned. You concealed that from me without mentioning it. When I saw you kissing like that, I knew you wanted more than I could give Ryan. Sweetheart, we cannot end our marriage over this. Nothing occurred. He was in town and invited me for lunch. I know I should not have gone, and I understand how envious you might be, but we have been together for so long. I figured hooking up with him after all these years would be no big deal. I dressed up to show him what he had missed out on when he left me. I wanted to confront him about how he had harmed me and show him how happy I was today. It still aches to think about how he abandoned me, and I wanted some closure. Yes, I did kiss him, but it wasn't romantic. It felt like two old friends reuniting or saying farewell. You need to believe me. I do not want anything to do with him. Please, sweetheart, let us get past this. I will do whatever it takes to make things right. Really? Doesn't this signify anything? Sandy heard about the chance to save their marriage. She grinned, eager to learn what actions to do. Yes, of course, I'll do whatever you want, sweetie, she promised. Okay, Sandy, I will give you one chance. Only one. I have one request. Allow me to see your cell phone. Why? She stared at me, bewildered. So, Sandy, if it means nothing, just give me your phone. I'd like to see if there are any messages for him and what you two have been talking about. No, you don't need to see this, she murmured, lowering her gaze to the floor. 
She knew reading the notes would harm me and expose something she did not want me to know. That is what I thought. So let's get back to my original question. How do we want to handle this? Her tears streamed as she begged pardon and promised never to repeat her behavior. It brought up sad recollections from my first marriage. I couldn't believe I was having this nightmare again. This time I would not fall for these falsehoods and allow it to continue. Wait, please wait. Ryan, if I offer you the phone, will you agree to give me another chance? You must understand that I adore you and have never been unfaithful. I admit that I became involved in a foolish online connection even with my ex-lover. But it was stupidity to act like a silly teenager. The flattery and compliments were seductive, tickling my ego. I understand how immature that sounds. If I gave you the phone, you need to promise me another chance. Sandy, I can't do that. But I promise you that if you refuse to give me the phone, our relationship will end. My next step will be to call Mark Wilson, the lawyer. I've already spoken with him and will have him file the divorce papers this week. She realized she had no other choice. I knew exactly what I would find on her phone. There were amorous texts during the last two months. All she could hope for now was that I recognized it as a silly emotional error and that she remained completely dedicated to me. She assumed that because there was no physical closeness involved, I would understand and forgive her. She feels she should have made it clear that she had no physical interaction with him or anyone else. Ryan launched the messaging application. He discovered Sandy in tears, her head in her hands, softly murmuring, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me for being so naive and stupid. Ryan, I love you and there is no one else. However, the text messages provided a different perspective. Sandy was the toughest on him, followed by Bill. I still love you. Cut using a knife, followed by, I have missed you. The rest appeared to be predictable, which fueled his rage, reminiscing about the past and wanting to be together. The last few messages, however, hit Ryan like a bolt of lightning. Sandy grumbled that her marriage was dull and Billy expressed a desire to reunite. I long for her figure. It hurt Ryan so much that he wanted to scream. However, her response, which included a suggestive photo with the comment, My little kitty can't wait. He slammed the phone down in disgust and tossed it on the table. Sandy, it definitely opened my eyes. I'll eventually forgive you, but I can't stay married to someone I don't trust. Your actions have demonstrated that trust is out of the question. What I've just read confirms my worst fears and I refuse to accept it. Maybe your partner can bring some excitement into your life now that he realizes what he's been missing. Sandy, I will miss you, but I will meet a woman who values me and does not hide behind lies and secrets. Ryan, what can I do to show you how much I care and persuade you to reconsider? That is the issue, sweetie. It would be different if you could tell me about your encounter with your ex when you returned home, but I already know you would not be trusting. Loyalty and honesty are everything to me, you broke them all without hesitation. You were aware of my past, but continued on without taking us into consideration. If you had called me, I would not have been pleased, but I would have understood. Now I'm wondering if this has happened previously. If we continued together, I would always question your honesty. What do you do while I am not around? Are you with him or someone else? I can't live my days with these doubts, and that is not fair to any of us. How do I forget how readily you lied? Yes. Kissing and dressing up for him is hurtful. The disappearance of your wedding bands is. But lying and dishonesty are unacceptable. One thing is certain. I'm not going to live like this anymore. Ryan, you're right on. And I messed up big time. I lied because I knew you'd be furious, but I felt I had no other option. Even if it was a mistake, I felt the need to quiet things down. I thought one meal would be harmless retaliation, but now I understand how mistaken I was, and I really apologize. I would never purposely injure you. Can we try to repair it? I hope to be as open and honest as you are. My problem is that I never want to hurt somebody and strive to avoid it whenever feasible. Now I realize that dishonesty simply makes matters worse. Honesty and openness are the only things that will save our marriage. However, you withheld information until you had no choice but to reveal it. You refused to allow me to see your text messages until you were forced to. Pretty much cemented your fate. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she sat there, recognizing how these letters revealed her deception and damaged trust. She knew I wouldn't put up with it and would ultimately realize that her emotional affair was as detrimental as a physical one. 
She promised never to make that mistake again. Unfortunately, our once happy marriage came to an end. Three months later, we formalized our divorce by selling the house and splitting our assets amicably. There was no reconciliation, vengeance, or hate. Only the ruins of a once idyllic partnership shattered by lies, treachery, and broken trust. I returned to the dating world, but after being burnt twice, marriage was not in my future plans. Meanwhile, Sandy and Billy slept together, and Sandy soon realized she was pregnant. When Billy heard the news, he abandoned her, claiming he wasn't ready for fatherhood. The next day, he disappeared, leaving Sandy alone with their child. Sandy's sister, Debbie, described her as a mere shadow of her former self. Her self-esteem crumbled once more. Sandy fell into profound melancholy after the terrible death of her baby as a result of a harrowing tumble down a long staircase in her apartment. Her once idyllic existence had unexpectedly turned into a nightmare, all due to her vanity and self-centeredness. She fought to forgive herself for ruining our once happy marriage and losing my love and respect. Trust, loyalty, and respect. If you make one mistake, you will lose them all. Here is the next story. A powerful tingling sensation in the man's groin gradually escalated into a scorching agony in his chest. He yelled as confusion overtook his mind. A six-foot-three-pound, 245 man should have felt invincible. He reflected that he was not in agonizing pain. That was his last thought as he lay motionless. Lay on the woman. Ouch, you huge fool, she yelled, seeking to urge him to move. That was not amusing, Fred, and you hardly lasted ten minutes. Frederick Freed. Penelope's partner, 29-year-old Fred Desmond, lay immobile, pressing hard on her with one of her arms crushed beneath him. She pushed hard to extricate herself from his weight, but he was too big for her, especially since he was virtually dead weight, attempting to grab her phone with her free arm. She realized her reach was too short to retrieve the device. Tears welled up from dread and frustration. It was clear to her that today would not end well. Penny's body tingled with numbness three hours later when she heard the back door of her house open, indicating the arrival of her children. She urgently called down to them, urging them to dial 911 and stay below, avoiding the second floor. Her 15-year-old daughter inquired, Should we call Dad too? No, no, Penny said immediately. Simply call 911 and wait for them downstairs. Paramedics arrived at the residence within five minutes of assuring the children's safety. They climbed the stairs to find Penny and her deceased partner. Penny's expression of guilt was reminiscent of a toddler caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Penny noticed the paramedic's short smirks. You may find it difficult to believe, ma'am, but this is not the first time we have encountered similar scenarios, said the senior paramedic. Apparently, situations like this can be exceedingly stressful, leading to heart attacks. Yeah, but he was just 29, Penny answered quietly. The younger paramedic stated that the autopsy should show anything interesting to the coroner. The paramedics were taken aback when they turned the body over. Fred Desmond, the dynamic evening news anchor for the CBS affiliate in Lansing, Michigan, had risen quickly to prominence. There were rumors in certain circles that he was about to take on a significant market anchor role soon after placing the deceased on a gurney and covering him. The paramedics focused their attention on Penny, who had been beneath the man's weight for more than two hours. Physically, she appeared to be in good health, but they encouraged her to contact a mental health specialist. Being under a dead body is the least of my problems, she said, embarrassed. Penny had just put on a soft bathrobe when her husband Dan burst into the room, panting from running up the stairs. Are you kidding me? He yelled fiercely as she moved away from him. Both paramedics positioned themselves in front of the woman, Mr. Matter. And this might not be the best time or place for this. Your children are right downstairs, the older paramedic warned. Dan replied, rolling his eyes and taking a deep breath. And even the paramedics knew it wasn't from rushing up the stairs. Seriously, Penny, can things get much worse? He exclaimed. Mr. Motten, if we believe your wife requires protection from you, we can have the police arrive in minutes, the older paramedic cautioned. Dan answered, I will not lay a hand on her, even if she deserves it. Penny noted that the paramedics nodded in accord. Have the kids contacted you? She inquired as they dragged the lifeless body from the house. No, I chatted with them, and you told them not to call me. Wonderful. Perfect. Getting the kids to cover for you, 
You are awful. Do you know that? Penny responded. No, Janet from down the street contacted me from work when the ambulance arrived. I suppose everyone in the area is already aware of what happened, Dan explained. The police scanner transmission made every Lansing news organization aware of Fred Desmond's death within half an hour. There were debates in newsrooms about whether to downplay the incident as a professional courtesy or to emphasize it due to Desmond's stature in the Lansing community. When Larry Richards learned of Fred Desmond's death, he immediately recognized the address where the paramedic called. It was none other than the residence of his lover, Penny Mattern. The realization struck him like a shockwave, leaving him both bewildered and wounded. Larry and Penny had been having a secret romance for just over a year. Larry texted Penny without hesitation, expressing his surprise with a simple WTF. Despite seeing the message on her phone, Penny's immediate anxieties eclipsed the emerging scenario. Larry, who worked as an anchor for Lansing's NBC affiliate for six years, earned respect in the town despite without the career power of his CBS opponent. Larry was astonished and outraged when he learned about Penny's apparent affair with his opponent. Knowing that the TV crew would be debating how to report Desmond's death, Larry called the news editor to convey his point of view and urge him to pursue the subject vigorously. The news editor, the only person at the station who knew about Larry's affair with Penny, was not surprised by Larry's viewpoint and totally agreed. This decision was not exclusively motivated by the competitive ratings with CBS. Larry admitted to himself that there were personal motivations at play. Penny was the executive director of Lansing's prestigious Arts Guild, and she understood the importance of having two important individuals in the community. The news editor couldn't help but acknowledge that the issue was newsworthy. Dan bluntly said, Get dressed, go downstairs, and figure out how to explain what happened to our children. They will stay with your parents for the next few days. Don't go into specifics, but don't minimize your mistake. The kids are old enough to realize you made a huge mistake. I will be listening. Call your parents next. Be honest with them, as it will most likely appear on the evening news tonight. Penny's eyes expanded like silver dollars when she realized the extent of the news coverage. In Dan's presence, she told their children that she had been unfaithful to their father earlier that day in their own bed. The individual involved was popular news anchor Fred Desmond, who died unexpectedly during their rendezvous. Did you actually murder him with sex, Mom? Their daughter? Ellie inquired, really. Wow. Penny blushed tremendously, and Dan groaned and retreated to the family room. Dan assessed the time it would take Penny and her children to get to her parents' place and discussed it with her parents. He set aside an hour to focus on important things like finding a decent attorney and resolving financial concerns. In his mind, divorce seemed unavoidable. Having known several divorced people, including a close buddy from the National Telecoms Corporation where he worked, Dan called for advice and support. Penny reappeared around 90 minutes later, looking as if she had taken repeated strikes to the stomach. Dan suspected the conversation with Penny's parents had not gone well. Knowing Morris's conservative principles, he imagined they were upset about their daughter's infidelity and the imminent public discovery. Penny sank upon the sofa across from Dan's lazy boy. When he looked closely, he noticed signs of severe tears. Well, that went as well as could be expected if I expected a terrible situation served on a blazing platter, she complained. I suppose I deserve that. Dan maintained an indifferent attitude as he stared at his wife, signaling her to proceed. I am sincerely sorry, Dan, she said. I apologize for the infidelity, for causing you anguish, and for breaking up our family in the most public way possible. You must understand that going public was never part of my strategy. Never. I don't know what happened today. He was only 29. Penny began to cry, covering her face in her hands, while Dan remained still in his chair. After a few minutes of sobbing, she looked up to see Dan's eyes with a distant expression, which she had never seen before from her affectionate husband. How long were you with him before you caused his death? Dan asked gently. Penny snorted. I didn't cause his death, she said forcefully. I believe we've been together for approximately three months now. That is a convenient term. It nearly sounds affectionate and innocent. I still prefer the plain phrase. It explains exactly what it implies. 
Dan noted. He interviewed me for a story. She said, we flirted, both of us. He was a tall and beautiful guy, a former college football player who remained in good shape. We had a couple lunches and then things progressed. He was quite good in bed. Dan said, that's good to know. Did you always interact with him in our bed? She lowered her eyes. I guess you are aware that he was married with two small children. Dan spoke harshly. These will be cherished memories you and he have left for them. I do not want a divorce. Daniel, please, I will do whatever you wish. You can get counseling if you wish. Please, she pleaded. Why should I care about what you want? Dan replied. You had a three-month affair with that jerk. You slept with him in our bed. He died on our bed. That will most likely be covered extensively in the news tonight. Damn it, woman. The kids and I will be mocked indefinitely because you couldn't keep your legs closed. Fred Desmond died after an apparent heart attack while in bed with a lady other than his wife, which dominated the news on three of Lansing's four leading television stations. Desmond's own station simply stated that the 29-year-old died after an apparent heart attack. That night, Dan moved into the guest room. He would never sleep on that bed again. Penny lost her work owing to negative press surrounding her affair with Desmond and his eventual death. She realized the board had no other choice if they wanted to keep their financing. Furthermore, her longtime partner, Larry Richards, called her to end their relationship, flinging obscenities at her character, among other concerns. You are a damn slut. How many other men were part in your terrible behavior? We're done, you know. Was just one of several insulting things he made during the five-minute call. Penny stayed rather quiet throughout the chat. The following week, she was served with legal documents at work. Dan, her husband, sought full custody of their children and produced written petitions from the children to live with him. He informed the judge that, despite being able to afford the mortgage on their home, he and his children intend to migrate in anticipation of a large negative public reaction. Penny appeared unhappy when she returned home that night. Neither her spouse nor her children tried to console her. They had been subjected to daily derision since the news of Desmond's murder leaked during her personal agony. Penny barely realized that she had missed her next menstrual cycle. With the time it happened again, followed with nausea, she realized she was expecting. A simple pregnancy test verified her suspicions. Do you really detest me this much? God, she said aloud to herself in the restroom. She waited until the family sat down to eat before disclosing her pregnancy. She winced when Dan choked on his lunch after hearing the news. She knew he was thinking about how the baby could potentially bind him in marriage. While she thought it was fortunate, Dan definitely did not agree. I highly doubt the child is mine will undertake a DNA test next month, Dan stated, shattering Penny's optimistic face. Do you not trust me? She asked incredulously. Have you recently demonstrated your trustworthiness? He replied. When Dan Morton's lawyer requested DNA from Fred Desmond's widow to compare with Penny's unborn child, she was upset. The attorney added that if the child is found to be Fred's, his estate may be required to pay child support. Maggie Desmond couldn't help but be angry with the situation, even if she understood Dan's point of view. Stupid damn lady. She silently cursed to herself. The testing occurred at the three-month mark. Surprisingly, neither Dan nor the late Fred had the same DNA results. When Dan received the test results, he confronted Penny aggressively. Really, Penny? He shouted. How many guys did you cheat on me with? You are a promiscuous person. Penny's lawyer had to seek a subpoena to obtain the DNA sample from Larry Richards, which eventually matched Mrs. Larry Richards. She was horrified to learn of her husband's association with Lansing's most notorious individual, as well as the financial responsibilities that would follow for the following eight years. Larry's pregnancy made Dan's candidacy for custodial parent status a clear winner during a talk regarding asset division. Dan questioned about the duration of the affair. Penny blushed and apologized once more. What else is new? Dan pondered to himself. Larry and I were romantically involved for more than a year, meeting once or twice every two weeks. Given my part-time job, it was very easy to get away during the day. You worked all day. You always put your whole trust in me. I betrayed your trust, Dan. I am sincerely sorry, Penny admitted, but was not sorry enough to stop or avoid taking on a second boyfriend. Seriously, Penny, two loves. Is it necessary for you to make me feel inadequate in bed? Dan questioned. 
Penny could see Dan's pain, and his eyes were well aware that she was the reason of his distress. She responded, You're an amazing lover, Dan. It was not about you. It was all about me and my weaknesses. I found Larry engaging, which led to us becoming intimate. To be honest, I enjoyed the physical aspect, but it was just for fun. There was no relationship to love. In my mind, I could distinguish it from what you and I had shared. After the early encounters, I stopped feeling bad because I had never taken anything away from our relationship. I was always there for you. Does it imply I was left out sometimes? Dan blurted out, feeling nauseated. Penny paused and glanced aside. She did not need to answer. Dan suddenly sprang up, dashed into the bathroom, and vomited violently. Penny followed him and paused in the doorway. Does this imply that I have occasionally consumed your sperm? He asked between heaves. Maybe a little, Penny croaked. But I always do my best to clean myself up before you come home. I never imposed anything on you. It was only after you insisted. I always told you I would never turn you down. Dan lunged into the stool once more. She was reasonably certain he had finished. Penny offered Dan a damp washcloth while he was cleaning himself up. He wondered how his life had drifted so far from its original direction. He initially met Penny at a Michigan State party during their junior year. She was a petite girl with small, perky breasts, long blonde hair, and bright green eyes. While he was a tall, skinny math geek with curly brown hair and a kind grin, they both had some sexual experience before meeting on a single date. Their relationship progressed into marriage. They were completely compatible in every aspect, especially sexually. During the early years of their marriage, nothing seemed off-limits in the bedroom, especially before the children arrived. Penny had a strong sexual appetite, and Dan made it his life goal to satisfy her every need. Their sexual interactions were less frequent and intense over time as their family expanded. To add excitement, the pair agreed to a monthly special date night. Dan has been really thinking about his marriage for the past few years. Did he ignore Penny's hints that she needed more intimacy? Could she honestly love him despite having two extramarital affairs? How could she defend such actions apart from their marriage? There was a lot to comprehend, yet the fact stayed constant. An 18-year marriage had become yet another statistical fatality. Dan's children completely understand their father's desire to relocate to another place. In the weeks preceding up to the end of the school year, their peers made unpleasant comments. Social media platforms were as harsh, coining an unattractive but potentially appropriate label for their mother sex murderer, MILF. Despite his children's protests, Dan scheduled multiple sessions with a psychologist recommended by his solicitor. Interestingly, both of his children took a liking to Dr. Charlotte Puhaka, a woman in her 30s. His daughter noted, She's pretty cool for a shrink, and she's not bad looking. Dad added his now adolescent son, playfully lifting his brow. I'm paying big money for you to chat to her, not slobber all over her. Dan reminded his son that, although he dropped off his children for their first session, he did not meet Dr. Puhaka until the second. Observing her, he had to acknowledge that his son's assessment of her beauty was correct. Dr. Puhaka, with her long blonde hair, bright blue eyes, alabaster skin, and long legs, appears to have the kind of beauty that Thor would like. Following the children's session, Dan and the psychologist had a quick meeting. He agreed with her assessment that he, too, would benefit from several sessions addressing his significant trust difficulties. Dan was unsure if he could ever conquer them. Dan attended 12 sessions, the same number as his children. He hoped that the tenacity of youth would allow his children to overcome their problems far faster than he could conquer his. He expressed this attitude to the psychologist, who told him that he may continue to seek her help any time he felt the need. But we won't be able to go on dates if I'm your patient, he said with a sneer. While that may be true, you are leaping to conclusions, said the doctor, who maintained a kind manner. Dan did not rush back into the dating scene, either with Dr. Puhaka or anyone else, despite getting expressions of interest from several female acquaintances. Even with Dan's alimony, she owns half of the couple's assets, her portion of the house sale proceeds, and pays child support. Following the birth of her second son, Penny realized that she needed to find at least a part-time work to support herself. She, too, relocated. 
ensuring that she remained distant from the place where the majority of her relatives now lived. In addition, she restored her maiden name and acquired her full formal name. Under the name Penelope Rhodes, she took pride in controlling her weight during pregnancy and quickly returned to her pre-pregnancy weight. Despite countless possibilities, she remained single. Men identified her as the sex killer MILF and made advances on her. Despite the fact that she had colored her hair brunette, they indicated interest in the challenge of pursuing a romantic encounter with her. The first time it happened, she burst into tears, and the second time, she fled the man at her new job. Nobody appeared to identify her as the notorious sex killer MILF. Even if they did, they were polite enough to keep it to themselves. As a 43-year-old single woman with a newborn and a part-time job, her schedule left little room for social activities. Despite the hurdles, she was able to reconcile with her parents and repair her relationship with them, ensuring that her third grandchild was not punished for the mother's previous faults. Dr. Charlotte Puhaka was surprised when Dan Mattern called her after over six months of silence. Since completing his therapeutic sessions, Although he had previously showed interest in a personal relationship, he had not followed through, causing Charlotte to believe he had met someone else. She greeted him casually. Hello, Dan. I was wondering if you had lost my phone number, Dan explained. No, I was simply allowing us both some time to move on. The doctors are not patient dynamic, and they are also proving that this is not a rebound situation. Charlotte couldn't help smiling. Patients frequently developed relationships to their therapists particularly male patients. But Dan appeared different. Charlotte was happy because she had found him interesting during their therapy sessions and thought him someone she wanted to know further. It didn't hurt that she found him attractive and sexually alluring. Dan was pleasantly surprised when he picked up Charlotte for their date the following Friday. She had always presented herself professionally during their past interactions, on this occasion, she went for a more casual yet notably appealing style. Charlotte donned a mid-thigh jean skirt, a tight white crop top that showed a few inches of her toned tummy, and three-inch heeled sandals. Dan, attempting to retain his composure, couldn't help but compliment her appearance as he met her at the door. I'm assuming my clothing meets your approval, she said casually as she walked by him towards his car. Yeah, Dan said attempting to keep up with her and opening the car door for her. Traditional manners? I like it, she purred. In that case, you can credit my mother when you eventually meet her, he remarked. Charlotte smiled to herself, having been on enough dates to cherish the tiny things that many men often neglected, such as opening doors for their dining destination. They chose a high-quality BBQ restaurant that also included selections from a local distillery, Initially, feeling a bit uneasy when offered a huge bib by the waiter, Charlotte spotted other guests wearing them and decided to accept Dan. Appreciating the pragmatism quickly took his bib as well. After realizing that Charlotte had eaten alcoholic beverages, Dan decided to order a whiskey sampler for both of them, along with a glass of ice water. Taking care to urge Charlotte to sip her whiskey, he proceeded to inform her about the precise sort of whiskey in each shot glass, including tasting notes for each. Charlotte expressed her admiration for his knowledge of spirits and how well the whiskey complement the barbecue. You're quite the aficionado, she teased her tone, indicating fun. You're like a liquor sommelier. Guilty as charged, he replied. Penny leaned more towards wine. I prefer distilled spirits. Dan hesitated and cringed slightly when mentioning his ex-wife, especially to someone who used to be his therapist. Don't worry about that. It's okay to talk about her, Charlotte reassured calmly. She was a significant part of your life for 20 years. It's natural for her to be in your memories. Don't suppress those memories or feel guilty when they surface. With time, they'll fade, especially as you create new memories with new people. Damn, I didn't expect us to be on the clock tonight, he joked. We're not, she said, playfully slapping his arm. After finishing the meal, Charlotte noticed barbecue sauce stains on her bib. This really saved my blouse, she commented while removing the bib. It would have been embarrassing to walk around the rest of the evening with barbecue sauce on my top. I would have volunteered to clean the blouse with my tongue. Remember, my mother taught me manners. Dan chuckled. Mr. Chivalry, Charlotte remarked as Dan wiggled his eyebrows. 
Dan had informed Charlotte that they would head to a music club after dinner, assuming it would be a country-western venue following their barbecue restaurant meal. She was taken aback when they arrived at a jazz club. Jazz? I would have bet on country. I thought we'd be lying dancing the night away, she remarked. Dan chuckled and shook his head, saying, No country, no hip-hop, no gospel. Screaming guitars are always good blues, good jazz, good. I'm a man with definite tastes. Do I fit into your definite tastes? Charlotte asked, making air quotes as she spoke. Most certainly, he replied. At the end of the evening, Dan received a chaste kiss. Upon returning home, he found both of his children waiting for him in the apartment's kitchen. Good day, Dad, Ellie asked with a big grin. Did you keep your hands to yourself and act like a gentleman? Bobby inquired with a matching grin. Give me a break here, guys. This is the first date I've had in more than 20 years. God, I'm out of practice, Dan admitted. Both kids exchanged grins before turning them on their father. I'm not going to help you, Dad. You're on your own here, Ellie giggled. But we do approve of your date. We both think Dr. Puka is great. Don't screw this up, Dad, Bobby said. Seriously, Dan and Charlotte were wrapping up their fourth date in two months, sipping Bailey's Irish cream coffee in Charlotte's living room when a serious expression appeared on her face. Dan, wouldn't you think about going on dates with other women? Maybe just for comparison. I'm worried that you're too focused on me and might miss out on someone you could really get close to, Charlotte suggested. What if I've already found someone I really like, he replied decisively, and I'm definitely fixated on you. Charlotte blushed and smiled as she took the coffee from Dan's hand. She lifted him to his feet and kissed him passionately. He returned the favor and she led him upstairs to her bedroom. In her bedroom. Charlotte kissed Dan, passionately, guiding him to the bed, eventually pushing him onto it. When she began to undress him, he reached out and ran his hands over her blouse, causing a prolonged moan. Their clothes were thrown off with equal haste, and he pulled her towards him, causing them both to fall onto the bed. A moment of hesitation flashed through Dan's mind when he realized that he had not been intimate with a woman for over a year. However, this thought quickly disappeared when Charlotte bit into him with a searing kiss. Charlotte's senses were overloaded, flashes flashed before her eyes, explosions echoed in her ears, and her body reacted intensely. When she came back to reality, she realized she was screaming and quickly stopped remembering how to pull herself together. Experiencing the woman's ecstatic cries propelled Dan into a heightened state of passion, engaging his tongue, lips, and fingers. He realized he had missed this more than he had initially thought. The exact moment the screaming ceased eluded him, and he became abruptly aware of the room, silence as the woman's body ceased its contortions. Despite hearing her breathing, he couldn't discern if she had passed out or was simply resting. Sure. You okay, babe? He murmured, receiving no response. He attempted once more, waiting a few seconds before detecting her movement. What? What was that? She asked unsteadily. You okay? Pretty sure. That was amazing. Can we do that some more? Yeah. He enthusiastically replied, resuming his attention on pleasuring her. The writhing and exclamations resumed, persisting for another ten minutes, during which the woman experienced three more intense orgasms, though she didn't lose consciousness again. Stop, 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 too sensitive, she croaked. Take me now, please, since you ask politely. He chuckled. Dan ascended the bed, passionately kissed. The woman aligned himself with her entrance and slowly and affectionately entered. She was moist and exceptionally warm. In a fleeting moment, he pondered when Penny had been as passionate for him. Realizing his thoughts, he hesitated briefly cleared his mind and refocused on Charlotte, vowing not to repeat that mistake as they found a rhythm. Charlotte wrapped her legs around Dan's thighs and they relished each other's bodies. He felt her climax twice more before sensing his own inevitable climax, building up, shifting to their sides after he finished. The two remained intertwined for a while, kissing, giggling, and engaging in soft conversation. Do you remember when I asked if you didn't want to date other women? Forget that you're mine. Dibs, Charlotte declared their next outing included Dan's children spending the day playing putt-putt golf and racing go-karts before dinner at a Mexican restaurant. Ellie, Bobby, and Charlotte instantly connected, bringing a constant grin to Dan's face as he enjoyed their conversation. Despite the ten-year age gap between Dan and Charlotte, 
it was hardly discussed as they made wedding plans a year later. However, when the topic of children arose, Dan expressed concerns about his age for starting another family. Charlotte desiring at least two children, and Dan compromised on two. Dan thought to himself, happy wife, happy life. Dan and Charlotte sat in the pediatrician's waiting room with their one-year-old daughter, anticipating the child's first annual exam. A familiar face emerged from the office, accompanied by a young boy. Surprised, Penny uttered, Dan, hey, as she glanced at Charlotte and the baby. Hi, Penny, it's been a long time. Is that your little guy? Dan inquired. The last time Dan and Penny shared a space was four years prior, during the signing of their divorce decree. Despite some new lines on her face and approximately 20 extra pounds, Penny still looked good to him. Observing Dan, Penny noticed gray speckles in his hair, but realized he seemed to be about the same weight and hadn't aged a day. She speculated that his natural and unforced smile might be connected to the pretty blonde woman holding the baby perhaps the reason for his perpetual youthful appearance. Penny introduced her son, Will, who is now five years old, and Dan presented Genevieve, their daughter. Dan then introduced Charlotte as his wife to Penny, saying, Kaka, Char, this is my ex-wife, Penny. The two women scrutinized each other. Penny was still grappling with the revelation that Dan had another child when she deduced that Charlotte was likely ten years her junior and Dan's. Charlotte stood up and extended her hand. Penny hesitated before accepting the gesture. It's very nice to finally meet you. The kids speak highly of you, Penny remarked. Charlotte simply nodded. Dan understood that his wife was gracious, but she wouldn't falsely compliment his ex-wife as it wasn't true. In Charlotte's presence, Ellie and Bobby only spoke about Penny's health. Dan had instructed his children not to discuss their mother in his presence, and they respected his request. Penny observed the baby and commented, She looks just like Bobby when he was a baby. Bobby seems to be a very protective big brother. He's grown into quite the young man, Dan replied. And Ellie has become quite the young woman. They appear to be from what little I see of them these days. Penny acknowledged, noticing Dan's expression, she added quickly, I'm not blaming them for not visiting more often. I know they're busy. I'd still like to see them more. I am their mother. Charlotte lowered her gaze, hoping the other woman wouldn't notice. She wasn't ready to reveal to Penny that both Ellie and Bobby had been addressing her as mom for the past two years. Feeling the need to break the awkward silence, Dan spoke up. I hope this is just a routine checkup. I hope everything is going well for you and your son. Penny sensed the hesitation in mentioning her son's name. She assumed Ellie and Bobby must have discussed Will occasionally, and she hoped Dan had simply forgotten. Dan noticed her eyes clouding over and felt a pang of guilt. Opting for honesty, he admitted, The kids and I rarely discuss you. You are their mother, and I'm grateful they have you in their lives to whatever extent they choose. However, the understanding is that we seldom talk about you at home, almost never. You broke my heart, and I felt the need for a clean break from you. The kids understand it completely. I don't have any knowledge about your life post-separation. Wow, Penny have whispered. We shared 18 good years together, and you can just shut me out of your life. As if our marriage never happened, like an annulment. That's harsh. You made your choices. Now I make mine to move forward with my life. I've moved on and live in the present, not dwelling on the past, Dan replied. So as I mentioned, I hope everything is going well for you. Penny recoiled, taking a step back as though Dan's response had physically struck her. It was one thing to be disliked. It was an entirely different experience to be pushed to the sidelines. Yeah, kind of, mostly. She eventually replied, I work part-time at a library and Will is in kindergarten. Occasionally I go out on a date. Not many men are interested in seriously dating a woman in her 40s with a young child. I know my fault. I didn't mean for you to go there. Dan winced visibly. Well, I guess that's my signal to leave, Penny said. Nice to meet you, Charlotte. Take good care of him. He's a good man. I forgot that once. And look where that got me. Penny took her son's hand and exited the waiting room. Dan self-consciously smiled at his wife. I know you don't have to say anything. Her mistakes led her to this moment. Not my problem. I won't lose a minute's sleep over her, Dan stated. You know I'm not your therapist. 24-7, Charlotte replied. Sometimes I'm just your wife, the mother of your baby. Now give me a kiss and stop analyzing me. 
Just love me. I can do that, he said.